God's word with me to Matthew chapter 6, and it's at this time I'll also pray uh, for the children who will go on to a Covenant Kids class for those kids aged 2 to 5 uh, who'd like to participate, and I'll also ask for God's blessing because we cannot rightly understand the word of God in the way that we truly need to in the depths of our hearts without his help, and so we're going to pray for those things together now. Holy Father, thank you that you are the one, as we heard at the start of this service, Lord, that you have knit us together in our mother's womb. Before a word is on our lips, it's all together known to you. Our days are numbered according to your perfect eternal purpose. And Lord, we know that's true for the children in this room. Forgive us, Lord, for sometimes making idols out of our kids and not trusting you with them. Lord, help us to trust you. You have a good and perfect plan for each person you've made. Lord, we ask that you would help these children grow up to be thriving in their faith in Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that even in these early years, you would give them a heart of faith to look and to behold Jesus Christ as the one true Savior from their sins. Father, we also ask that as we remain in this room and open your word, Lord, we do so from a posture of humility and in dependence upon you. Lord, we ask that through the power of your spirit, you would illumine your word to our hearts this morning. Cause it to bear good fruit in our minds. Help us to understand it, not in the way of hearing intelligible words, but in the way of being transformed in our inner man to more and more reflect your glory, Lord Jesus. It is in your name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you, little ones. You can make your way to the back door if you're uh, going to be a part of the class. And as I said, we're in Matthew chapter 6, and we're looking this week at verses 9 through 15, which we'll be looking at in a two-part series. Originally, I wanted to cover this passage uh, all together in one week, um, but it just couldn't be done. Uh, by the time I had written the majority of that sermon, I realized that about halfway through it, uh, everyone's tanks would already be completely overfull. Um, and the rest of the sermon, I would just be staring at people who are going, is this almost over yet? <laughs> so we're going to take two weeks um, so that we can really uh, marinate our hearts and minds in what Jesus wants to teach us about prayer. Hear the word of the Lord this morning as it is read to you from Matthew's gospel, beginning in verse 9. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Jesus begins this section with a very simple statement. Pray then like this. And the word pray there is in the present tense in such a, in such a way that it's in the Greek is a habitual or continual action. This is how Christians are to go on praying throughout their Christian lives. And he uses another word for what we translate like this, uh, is a word, Greek word, hutas. And that word does not mean um, this exact thing, but in this way or in this manner, according to this custom. And so what Jesus is doing here is teaching us that we ought to go on praying throughout our Christian lives according to the pattern for prayer that he gives us here. And you can see at the top of your notes this morning, I, the first thing I've written is that the Lord's Prayer is a model. It is a model for us. Jesus is not saying, pray these exact words, per se. He's not saying, this is the only right formula in terms of the exact words to speak to God. That's not what Jesus means. He's giving us a model to be guided by. Instead of saying, pray these exact words, he's more saying, be guided by this pattern. Now, I want to make a couple of brief comments on that. First, I would say it, there's nothing wrong at all. In fact, it would be very good for us to memorize the Lord's Prayer word for word and to sometimes pray it 
as it has been given to us. But when we do that, I want to, to say a couple of thoughts on that. First, this is not an incantation, okay? This is not a, a, something to be recited before God that, you know, regardless of your heart or whatever, if you say the right words, then some good thing will come out of it. God is not interested in prayers that we think are uh, sort of like a lucky rabbit's foot, like I mentioned earlier. Um, we are to pray to God from our heart with sincerity, as we saw last week. And so it's not about getting it exactly right. Rather, it is about coming to God according to what he gives us in terms of priorities and focus. And the second thing I have for you on the notes this morning is just that. The subjects and their sequence of the Lord's Prayer are to shape the requests and priorities of our own prayers. The subjects and their sequence are to shape the requests and priorities of our own prayers. Prayers. You can see I've provided something of an extensive outline on the left, a little more than maybe most weeks. And that's because as simple as the Lord's Prayer is, it is altogether complex and, and very, very profound. Our Lord has put together in these few words something truly that is inexhaustible for us in terms of our full grasp and comprehension of the beauty and depth therein. So what you see in the furthest section there is that it breaks really well into two sections. And the first one, we'll see a focus on God's glorious person and purposes. It's all about God. And it's all about what God has ordained from eternity and that unfolding in time. Before we pray anything concerning ourselves directly and our temporal needs, we are focused on the Lord and on his purposes. In this world. The second half, then, we go to a focus on our comprehensive dependence upon God. And there you see, give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. We come to God in this half for our provision, our pardon, and our protection. But this prayer also, if you move to the next section, or the third section there, you can see that it has a preface and six petitions, or six requests, six categories, if you will, that Jesus is giving us that should define our approach to prayer, the model or pattern for Christian prayer. Even in that simple outline and the brief amount I've shared, you can already tell there's a lot here to consider. It's not so easy to sort of just read through and, oh, got it. Uh, this really takes some time for meditation and consideration. What is it that the Lord is wanting me to value, wanting me to prioritize, wanting me to pray back to him in my own private prayer life. You'll notice as well, and I want to point this out because this will be the most challenging part of this as the preacher. Um, Jesus is not in any way confining us to pray for a very small number of things. In fact, each of these is uh, almost infinitely broad. Uh, he's not closing us in, sort of, you know, if you think about a river, you might think about a river's banks as confining it or restricting it. But in fact, a, a more proper way would be that it's actually those banks that give it its force and direction and power. And that's kind of the, the picture here. Jesus is not meaning to restrict us rather so much as to propel us into true prayer for the things that God uh, is pleased to hear in prayer. And so each petition includes a broad spectrum of prayers. In other words, when we talk about each of these petitions, we're talking about a category that includes all kinds of wonderful prayers that could be prayed in relation to that category. And that spectrum goes all the way from conversion, meaning someone who, for instance, when we get to hallowed be your name, we might pray that God would actually reveal himself to this person who's never before truly understood in their heart that they live in a world created by God. Well, but that doesn't mean that you who know that there is a God don't pray, hallowed be your name. It means that in that spectrum, where you fall, where you are, there are prayers that we might pray where God's name might be hallowed much more in our hearts. That we, though we know him, we ought to know him more. We know there's more of him to be known. And so that will make more sense as we go through the text today. But I wanted to set us up there. Now, let's begin by looking at the preface of the prayer. Our Father in heaven, Jesus says. This is how you uh, come to God in prayer. The preface, Our Father in Heaven, teaches us three things about the right heart posture for approaching God. Three very important things. And I want to show them to you now. First, 
we offer our prayers to God on the basis of our adoption through the gospel of grace. We come to our Father. Now, how is it that God is to be called our Father? He is not the Father of the unbeliever. He is the Father of the Christian who has been saved by grace. So here, right from the beginning, he's reminding us that we're coming to God on the basis of his grace, on the basis of his love for us, on the basis of what he has done for us through Jesus Christ, his son, the salvation that we have received by faith. And so we come to a father as a son who is loved by that father. And that is so important because not only does it give us a picture of that we come to God through an intimate relationship of love, but it also reminds us of something. When we come to God, we often come to him with many struggles, many weaknesses, many doubts and fears and failures. But if a son comes to his father and the, the son has made a mistake, does that son need to be worried that because he made a mistake, he'll suddenly stop being a son? No. An employee who continues to make mistakes might be fired, but a son is a son. A son's relationship to that father cannot be removed. And how much more for that good heavenly father to which we come. We are not coming on the basis of performance, but based on the relationship that he has established. That is an unchanging and eternal relationship of grace. Secondly, we come with a view to God's glory. So first, on the basis of our adoption, with the intimate relationship of father and son, but secondly, with a view to God's glory as the exalted God in heaven, our father in heaven. You see, we sometimes bring, we separate God as if he's just the one or just the other. Sometimes God is altogether transcendent and he's so glorious that we could never approach him at all. And then other times we have a God in our mind who's so imminent that we bring him down and almost humiliate him by making him so small and like ourselves. Here what we are doing and what Jesus crafts for us is that we're coming to the God who is our father. He is imminent. He has come to be with us. And yet he is in heaven. He is on the exalted throne above all other thrones. He is transcendent and glorious. And this is important for three uh, specific reasons. First, the fact that we're praying to our Father in heaven reminds us that God alone is the only one who is worthy of our prayers to begin with. Have you ever thought about praying to someone else and how foolish and powerless and ineffective that would be? It is the fact that he is God in the heavens that makes him worthy to hear the prayers that we offer. But not only worthy to hear them, but number two, able to not only hear them, but to act in response to them, to hear our prayers and to uh, grant to us those things which are needful and glorifying to him. But the third thing is this, that we, only, we do not merely come to a father who is eminent, but we come to the God who is in heaven and transcendent. We must come to God, though he is our father, he is the almighty Lord. He is the king of kings. And just as a child, I've often thought of this. Imagine that your father was the president of the United States or the king of some great nation. And you're a little, you're a little child, and you don't really fully grasp what it means that your father is the president of the United States. You don't really understand the concept of that very well as a little kid. And so you just run right into the Oval Office. You just run, hey, Dad, Daddy. I mean, he's meeting with foreign ambassadors. He's talking with all these, these important things are happening, these very high Matters are taking place, but you don't care because you're, you're, that's your daddy. You run right in, our father. But imagine that if that child, and they should, they should run to their daddy. They should see and know, I have a special privileged relationship with him. But imagine if that child, as they continue to grow toward maturity, never ever changes the way they see their father to come to see not less of him, but more of the fullness of who he is. Imagine if there's never a time where, there, where a reverence and respect comes for the dignity of the office that he holds. That would be a, a wrong relationship. And so what Jesus is teaching us here is, yes, come to your father, run to your Abba, your daddy, but know that he is the God of heaven. Come to him on the intimacy of his grace, but with reverence for his glory. The third thing we see in this preference, not preference, preface, is 
that we pray with and or for three, three categories of people we'll see throughout this prayer. Ourselves, our fellow saints, and the lost and unconverted in the world. Notice the communal nature. It's interesting that Jesus just got done saying, go into your closet, close the door, and pray. And then the first word he gives us in the model prayer is our. Our. So even if prayer is private, it is not exclusive for oneself. It is, a, it is an, an avenue through which we lay hold of the throne of grace, not only for ourselves, but for our fellow saints, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and for those in the world who need Christ. We pray to our Father on behalf of ourselves and others. Now, let's move into the first section here of the, the first half of these petitions. The first three petitions make up really a, an overarching uh, body in themselves. And they focus on God's glorious person and purposes. They do not focus on our fleeting temporal cares. And now if we were to assess, and this isn't meant to, to beat anybody up, we're all, we're all growing, we're all right there with each other. None of us are really very, very far along in prayer, okay? Don't get, don't get a high head here. Uh, the disciples didn't know how to pray. Luke, Luke, Luke's gospel recounts that when Jesus taught them the Lord's Prayer, it was because they came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. In other words, we, we don't know how. Well, we're in good company with them. But I, I, I would venture a guess that if we were to somehow take our prayer life and somehow break it down to uh, that which is focused on fleeting temporal cares compared to that which is focused on God's glorious person and eternal purposes, that the scales would be rather imbalanced. I think that we would, we, our prayers are, are extraordinarily uh, frequent and heavy on the temporal care side. And really, we find ourselves struggling to get more than a sentence or two out on the other. And what you see when Jesus is teaching his redeemed children, those who are sinners, being sanctified, being uh, grown up into their faith, he's teaching them a whole new way to order their lives through this model of prayer. The, this model for prayer is intended to reorient the priorities, concerns, and focus of our lives. Listen, who is teaching us to pray here? The Lord Jesus. And he is ordering these priorities according to his infinite wisdom. And now we all take advice. We consult people for advice on this or on that. Which, you know, what car should I purchase? What, how's my golf swing? All these other things. We listen to people. Will you not hear the counsel of the infinitely wise God as he tells you, these are the most important things and in this order? Will we not listen when God says, pray like this, not like those other things that we might be prone to do? And again, the point is not to, to beat us up. If you're praying, praise the Lord, but let's grow. Let's, add, let's trust the Lord to teach us to pray as, as God calls us to. The overarching focus of these first three petitions is this. The central desire is the unhindered forward march of God's kingdom. If you look at these first three petitions, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you were going to bring all three of those under one theme or heading, this is it. It's that we are to pray for the unhindered forward march of God's glorious kingdom. That's what Jesus is saying is most important. That's what he's saying, pray for this. Set your heart, set your focus, set your affections, your priorities, your concerns, your meditation upon these things. The forward march of God's glorious kingdom in this world. But how does his kingdom go forward in this world? Well, he teaches us in each of these petitions. The first petition says, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. And your first blank this morning is this. In the first petition, we pray for a right recognition of God. We pray for a right recognition of God. In other words, you see the parentheses there, we pray for God to be God in our eyes. We pray for God to be God in our eyes. Now that sounds a little bit maybe not that thrilling, but it's actually incredibly important. It is not an exaggeration to say that absolutely everything that is wrong with this world is because God's name has not been hallowed in it. This is not a small prayer request. 
This is not something to brush past until you get to the really important stuff like your cares for today. This is the eternal problem in every heart is that God is not seen as God by the eyes of men. And Jesus says that we are to pray, hallowed be your name, or may your name be hallowed. Well, what does hallowed mean? Hallowed means greatly revered and honored. It comes from the same word that we use in the scriptures for holy. Holy be your name, or sanctified be your name, set apart be your name, hallowed be your name. In other words, we, we are praying that God's name would be lifted high above all others, that God would be acknowledged and seen for who he truly is. And when we say name, we're not speaking here strictly of his moniker, the, the name by which we call him. His name represents his entire person. In other words, may you, God, your entire person, all that you are, be revered and honored in the eyes of men. That's the prayer request here. And so we see that the first order of prayer, the most important thing that Jesus wants us to pray for, is that all men would come to acknowledge the one true living God. This is the prayer request Jesus puts first, that all men would come to acknowledge the one true living God, that his name would be hallowed in the eyes of men. Some examples of what this means is that we pray for God to be personally recognized as the holy, almighty, and sovereign Lord. We pray for unbelief and ignorance to be overcome in ourselves and throughout God's world. Listen, the world rejects the truth. The scriptures, don't, the scriptures teach us it is not that man does not know there is a God. It's that he knows there is a God and suppresses that truth by his sin. Romans chapter 1. All men know that they were created by God and that they are accountable to him. But they suppress that truth in unbelief and in rebellion. And even in the church, and again, this is not meant to be heavy, but it is important for us to hear, even in the church, there is rampant ignorance of God. Even among his people, they know the blood of Jesus and they never went any further. The blood of Jesus was an entrance into an eternal relationship with the God of all glory, not the end of that relationship. He saved us to know him, to enjoy him, to have right fellowship with him in eternity. How can we enjoy that with a God with whom we are ignorant? His name is not hallowed as it ought to be, even in the hearts of his people. And so we pray that God would overcome these things. We pray that wherever God is not revered and honored, whether in private hearts or in public spheres, that he will advance upon such places and vindicate his glory by all needful means. You hear the, the power of this prayer. You hear the desire of it. It's not for a cozy life and a good retirement. It's that this world will reflect the glory of the almighty God. This is what Jesus says is the prayer of his people. He calls for us to ask God to hallow his name among all sectors of society, among all the hearts of men. So what might this look like? And again, the challenge of this sermon, as I said at the beginning, is that this is a spectrum. There are infinite prayers that could be prayed in relation to what it means for God's name to be hallowed. There are all kinds of ways that this can manifest in our lives. Perhaps you know someone personally that you know they don't trust in the Lord and you want to pray, Lord, hallow your name in that person's life. Maybe we see in our own nation where our every dollar bill says, in God we trust, and every heart says, in God I've never trusted and I couldn't care less. And so we pray for our nation. We pray for our elected officials. There's all kinds of ways that this can manifest, which makes it hard to preach because there's more that could be said. But here are two very broad examples. For believers, whether for ourselves or for our fellow saints in the church, we pray to grow in both the intellectual and experiential knowledge of God. In both the intellectual and experiential knowledge of God. What do I mean? Well, some of you could pass a test on the attributes of God. You could score rather well. 
But does your private life of love for God and worship reflect the score you would get on that test? Does your intellect match your experience? Does what you know in your head match the way you live in your life? Does what you've learned about God, is it manifesting in you with a fire of devotion to him? Or is it just information? Is it just fire insurance? Is it just this sort of, well, I I checked the box and now I'm good. Someday I'll get there, but for now I'm really going to focus on here. We pray that God's name would be hallowed in our hearts, not just that we would grow more in knowledge, but more in the experience of the worship of God through that knowledge. Not that we drift into a, a, a fanaticism or an emotionalism, but if you truly behold the glory of the living God, it will grip your soul, beloved. Worship is not something you muster up. It is the overflow of beholding God, of him being hallowed in our hearts. We don't come here and sort of spin the wheels and make sure, okay, I got to work it up. No, the reason our worship is dim, the reason our affections are cold is because we have not put ourselves by the fire of God's glory as he's revealed it to us in his word, the truths of who he is. We're not laying hold on the hallowed name of the mighty God. For the lost, those who are not Christians, how do we pray, hallowed be your name? Well, we pray for God to open the eyes of their heart to behold him who is true. We pray that God would help them to see, that God would, in his mercy, overcome their spiritual death and blindness and open their eyes. Perhaps some of you can think back in your own lives. Some of you were raised in Christian homes, and maybe you don't remember a day when you didn't know who God is. But others, like myself, remember many days when I didn't know who God is. And I remember the day that God, in his infinite mercy, opened the eyes of my heart and hallowed his name in the dark blackness of my sin and showed me not only who he was, but by showing me who he is, He also showed me who I am. And it led me to repentance and to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallowed be your name is what Jesus says we are to pray. We pray for a right recognition of God. We pray for God to be God in our eyes, in the eyes of men. The second petition, your kingdom come, Jesus says. Your kingdom come. In the second petition, we pray for a right response to God, a right response to God. We pray for God to be king of our hearts. The focus here is very close with the following petition, your will be done. They are close and inseparable, nevertheless distinct. Just like justification and sanctification are distinct and yet not separable. So too is the kingdom coming and his will being done distinct but not separable. And that is what Jesus is teaching here. In one sense, we can see the flow of redemption happening in these prayers, but but that's what's so challenging is that it's not only the flow of God's work of salvation, hallowing his name in the heart of a sinner, bringing his kingdom to bear on their heart, causing his will to be done within them as they become sons of his, but it's also for those who are already his people hallowing his name all the more, his kingdom coming all the more, his will being done all the more. And that makes it difficult to preach on, but hopefully you can see both happening within that spectrum that I mentioned. So what are we praying for in this second petition? We pray for a right response to God, the God who has hallowed his name, who's revealed himself to us. That beckons a response If you have come to behold God, a response is warranted. And there are many wrong responses, but we're not interested in those responses. What we want to see is the right response. God's kingdom comes wherever his name is hallowed. Can his kingdom come where his name is not hallowed? Do you see the sequence here? He reveals himself to us, his person. He then accomplishes his work or his purposes, God's person and purposes are are present here. 
he reveals himself and then he brings the authority of his kingship and his dominion to bear upon the hearts and lives of those to whom he has revealed himself. And so here, uh, it is here where God's name is hallowed and his, that his kingly rule advances upon the hearts of sinful men as they become citizens of God's kingdom. Another way to put this is this. Wherever God is rightly beheld, he is rightly believed in. Wherever God is rightly beheld, he is rightly believed in. Those who reject God do so because they don't see him as he truly is. No one can look upon the infinite glory and perfection of who God is, seeing it truly, and turn then for something else. It is when God, God's name is hallowed that his kingdom comes to bear. And so the second order of prayer, the second thing Jesus calls us to em emphasize is that all men would have hearts submitted to God's sovereign authority. Submitted to God's sovereign authority. In this we pray for all people to turn from their sin unto God and gladly surrender to the rule and reign of Christ as Lord, as Savior, and as the magnanimous king of their life. Magnanimous is a big word, but I don't know another one that means the same thing. It means that he's infinitely beyond us and greater than us, and yet he's gracious toward us. It is that he is an infinitely wonderful and altogether glorious king, and yet he has time for the lowly one like you and like me. We're praying here that God's authority would come to bear in our hearts. And it's interesting that when Jesus is teaching us to pray, he doesn't pray um, how, he, he teaches us to pray, hallowed be your name. He doesn't teach us to pray, um, may people like you, God. Um, he doesn't teach us to say, uh, he teaches us your kingdom come. He doesn't say, uh, may you make us feel good inside. He, th may you give us a really good therapeutic message about how we're, we're bad, but you really like us inside and it's okay. He doesn't do that. That's not how Jesus teaches. That's how the church who is straying but Jesus says, he is king. He is king. That is a declaration of lordship. That is a declaration of authority. That is a declaration of power. And consequently, it is a declaration of the submission of those who belong to that king. Jesus is calling us when he speaks of us coming into a right response or a right uh, walk with God, when we see who he is, we will gladly surrender and submit to his kingly authority. We pray for ourselves and the world to cease from sinfully resisting God's rightful and holy rule over us and over every aspect of our lives. When we pray, your kingdom come, we pray for ourselves and for the world to cease from sinfully resisting God's rightful and holy rule over us and over every aspect of our lives. This is not only true for those who are not Christians, but beloved, do we not see this in our own hearts and lives? Do you find yourself resisting the kingship of God in your life? Do you find yourself living as though he's not Lord, as though his authority doesn't have final say over absolutely every part of who you are. Jesus says, may your kingdom come. May God's kingship, his authority, his lordship come to bear upon the hearts of men. In this petition, we not only pray for our own um, ceasing from resisting, but we pray and offer prayers of holy war as it were. How so? Well, when we pray, your kingdom come, God's kingdom is not advancing into neutral territory, beloved, but rather into hostile territory. God is not sort of coming into an open meadow of, of peacefulness with the, you know, the butterflies are there and the little bunny rabbits and there's, there's no worries. It's just this nice little glib place. That's not what is taking place where his kingdom comes, his kingdom comes in power to overthrow the existing regime of sin and Satan and death. 
The reason that God's name is not hallowed, the reason his kingdom is not being received is because there is another regime in place in our hearts and in the hearts of the people of this world who are resisting the one true God, resisting his authority, refusing submission to him. And so we pray that God would help those who are under the dominion of sin, lost in the power of darkness, deceived by all kinds of things that people believe are true and are utterly false, that they would be delivered from those things and that Christ's lordship would be established in their lives. Finally, we are praying for God to become the king of every sinner's heart, for God to convert them from being his enemy to being his loyal subject through repentance and faith. We're asking that the kingship of the Lord Jesus would come to bear in all its fullness upon our hearts, upon the hearts of our fellow saints, and upon the people of the world. And I want to just reiterate one more time on this point before we move on. Jesus is giving us a picture of authority here. And in our culture today, in our world, especially among men, but it's not exclusive to men, we have a real problem with authority. We are rampantly and, and to a fault, individualistic, and, and really we consider ourselves the master and king of our own life. That is from the old regime, beloved. That sentiment, that attitude in your heart and in your life is from the old regime that this kingdom is coming to destroy. When we pray, your kingdom come, we're asking, Lord, give me a heart of submission before your authority as Lord over my life. And the third petition your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the third petition, we pray for a right relationship with God. That's your next blank, relationship with God. So first, we pray for a right recognition that, that God would be God in our eyes. Second, we pray for a right response to God. We pray for God to be king of our hearts. Thirdly, we pray for a right relationship with God. We pray for God to be Lord of our lives. Where his kingdom has truly come, his will will be done. If I claim to you that Greensboro is my kingdom and then I give any kind of a command and no one even jumps or flinches, would you believe that I really had any kind of kingly authority over this land? No, it would be a facade. It would be a ruse. Is God's kingship in the lives of his people in the church a facade? Is it a ruse? Once again, and again, this, this can sound heavy, it's not meant to. It's meant to help us. But we have been fed so many lies about a watered-down gospel that's all about you. Clearly, we see that in Jesus' priorities, he says, may God be lifted high, may his priorities, his kingdom come, and may his people obey him in holiness. Holiness has almost become a byword in the church, as if that somehow is this evil idea that's contrary to the gospel. Beloved, nothing could be further from the truth. Holiness is the fruit of grace bearing out in the lives of those who've been redeemed. It's the sign that Christ and his work and his grace is at work in you. An unholy people who have no reverence for God's authority and do not hallow his name have no business thinking for a moment that they have truly come under the saving authority of Christ. It is not a watered-down, therapeutic, humanistic, American-made gospel. It is a timeless gospel where there is a true king who is glorious beyond measure and yet stoops low for the sinner, who brings his kingdom in such a way as not to destroy the rebel, but to bring him into his kingdom and to teach him 
to forsake the ways of his rebellion and evil, which were to his own demise, and instead to teach him that the, the will of this king, the will of God, the holy will of God would be done. God's will is done wherever his lordship is established and gladly received by his subjects. So in this third order of prayer, we pray that men would joyfully strive to trust and obey God's holy will in all of life. Joyfully, beloved. A joyful pursuit of holiness. I know, because I am a man too, that there are plenty of days that my heart does not feel that way. And I know that many of you, and I don't mean this negatively or hurtfully, but it's true and needs to be said. I know that many of you, even right now, hearing me talk to you about the call to holiness feels like a ton of bricks that you don't want to carry. And you're going to throw it off the moment you walk out this door. But will you hear the word of God for your good? God is not calling you to harm when he calls you to holiness. He's not calling you to to be hurt or to have something taken from you. He's calling you to lay hold more fully of the gift of life. Do You know, when people talk, and I've said this before, but it's worth repeating, there is so much talk in our society today of human flourishing. We want human flourishing. We, all this, people are oppressed, all these system, systemic this and all this garbage, stuff that's completely ridiculous. And they come up with all of these worldly solutions which are accomplishing nothing to actually bring about the good end that is desired. Human flourishing is simply another word for holiness. If you want this world to flourish, then it needs to become holy. Because in holiness, there is no wrong done. There is no sin done. There is no hatred done. There's no division done. There's no oppression done. There's no racism done. There's no self-centeredness and narcissism and egotism done. There's no selfishness and greed. There's no adultery. There's no divorce. There's no drunkenness. There's no orgies. There's no Uh, pornography on the internet. In holiness, all of that is gone. When the kingdom comes and his will is done, the world will be made right. What is Jesus teaching us to do? He's saying, put away the garbage of religion that you've been fed, Pharisees and scribes, and take up the true religion with a hallowed name of the Almighty God and an everlasting kingdom that rescues sinners and brings them to life. And causes the good and holy will of God to rule the land. As it is in heaven, beloved. We pray that we would love holiness and strive to pursue it. We pray that we would hate our sin. We pray that we would sincerely desire to live for God's glory. I want to show you something as we begin to close here this morning. I told you in... The first petition, hallowed be your name. I told you that the word hallowed there is the same word for holy that we use throughout the scriptures. Look down with me at the third petition, which closes the first half, the first section of this prayer. Your will be done. Notice the correlation. Where God's name is hallowed, remember, holy, his people will be hallowed. Holy. A holy God brings forth a holy people. And it works the same way in reverse, beloved. We often think that the way we're going to reach the world is by trying to be like the world. That is a lie. The world will not hallow the name of God when they look at your life and it looks just like theirs. The world will not hallow the name of a God who's so impotent and powerless that he can't change anything about your values or what you really live for. The world will not hallow the name of God when the church looks just like the world. It is when the church prays, make us holy as you are holy. Make us a people in whom your will is done that the world sees the distinction and hallows the name of God. I want to share two last things with you as we close. The first is this. Jesus 
teaches us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is not just a picture of perfection. Of course it is that. But it is also a picture of completion. When we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in one sense we're praying, Lord, help us, help our lives, the lives of our fellow saints, the lives of the people of this world, look like the holiness of heaven, trusting you, obeying you. In another sense, we are praying toward the completion of what God promises in the gospel. That he will bring his kingdom to earth as it is in heaven, in the new Jerusalem. That when Christ returns, he will overthrow every evil regime. He will put away sin, Satan, and death. He will slay the dragon as it were. He will bring his kingdom to bear. It will be on earth as it is in heaven. Beloved, as we struggle through this life, both with our own weaknesses and our own sins, and as we look at this world and we mourn, and sometimes we're angry and confused and jaded, we can know as we pray these words, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that he has promised it will be so. It will be so. Christ will return to establish his eternal kingdom. The last thing I'll share with you is at the bottom of your notes there. How does God bring such prayers to pass? We've looked at this, and, and, I, and I, I, admittedly, this is a challenging text to preach, a very challenging text for me to preach, because there are 10,000 ways that we can pray according to these priorities. It can look very different in each of our lives. But One thing I I think we might miss is this. How does God accomplish what he's calling us to pray for? How does he do it? When we pray, hallowed be your name, what would it look like like if he answered us? When we pray, your kingdom come, what, what would that mean? How would he bring his kingdom? When we pray, your will be done, is that just gonna pop out of thin air? I mean, is this, are we just waiting for a zap? Are we waiting for some mystical feeling to stir up in our hearts? What are, we, what are we praying for? What are we looking for? Beloved, the answer is this. The way that God advances his kingdom and brings these things to pass is by God's people, the church, faithfully living holy lives while boldly proclaiming God's word as they depend upon and walk in the power of God's spirit. How does God do it? God's people preaching the gospel in the power of the Spirit. That's how it happens. How will God's name be hallowed? Because you will be raised up and sent out to the world to live for Christ. How does his kingdom come? Because you will be telling others about the one who came and lived and died on the cross for sinners the one who offers the world the only path of redemption and forgiveness. You will be preaching the gospel. We here, whoever's preaching from this pulpit, will be proclaiming Christ. That's how he's going to do it. And guess what? All of your witnessing, all of your sharing, all of my preaching is nothing but hot air unless the Holy Spirit of God blows upon it and gives it effectiveness and life. And so we do not go thinking that our technique or our winsomeness is somehow going to get the job done. It's not. None of us are sufficient for these things. But God, through his spirit, has promised to work through his word as it is carried forth by his people. And so lastly, look again at these petitions. How will God's name be hallowed? Through your holy life being lived before the eyes of the people in this world. They will see a hallowed king by his hallowed people. They will then come to God. Your kingdom come through the proclamation of the gospel as we share Christ. And how then do we become a people, not just who are citizens of the kingdom, but who live like citizens of the kingdom? Where the king's will is actually done in our lives, it's through discipleship. That sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Go, therefore, to all nations, discipling them, 
baptizing them, teaching them. Huh. Wow, I guess this Jesus knew something about what he had to say, didn't he? How is God going to fulfill these things? He will work through his church as we faithfully follow our king on mission with his message in this world. Let's pray. Oh, Lord. These things are so much more wonderful than I have been able to articulate. I pray that you would cause them to be planted deeply in our hearts by your strength and by your power. Father, the weakness and ineffectiveness of myself is felt deeply today. These things are wonderful. And my own experience of them in my own words seem as though a grain of sand upon the shore of the ocean. But Lord, you promise to work not by the power of men, but by the power of your spirit as your word goes forth. You declare that it will not return void, but will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. May you be pleased to make good on that declaration this day. In our hearts we pray. Amen. Beloved, let us stand together and give...